My name's Nicholas Oakley. And Dave Shugrin. And who was not in the first part? Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. So we'll do a little bit of a recap. Um, do you want to start? Sure. Since you so the time. other, we'll caveat, it's yeah. super awkward for both of us to be forced to stand behind mm -hmm. the podium because the microphone is here. So happy to be part of the live streaming and pulling people in, but just awkward. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. So Dave Shugrin, she, her pronouns, and I am the LGBTQ+, uh, Disproportionality, Commercially Sexually Exploited Children's Program Manager inside the Office of Child Welfare. So a little caveat because I know uh, we've just changed names. Um, the Children's Administration used to fall under DSHS uh, umbrella and we've pulled out from under DSHS and joined with the Department of Early Learning to have the newly formed, as of July 1st, Department of Children, Youth, and Families. And uh, in 2019, the Rehabilitation Administration and the Office of Juvenile Justice will join us um, inside the DCYF and potentially then uh, be followed by the Office of Homeless Youth. So those are all the things about my title. <laughs> uh, and as you can see, I have a very similar title today, but I'm at the Center for Children and Youth Justice, not to be mistaken for the Department of Children, Youth, and Families. Mm -hmm. So we're a nonprofit located in Seattle, but operates statewide uh, with a sole mission of uh, reform within the juvenile justice and child welfare systems. So we do this all through collaboration with these system <laughs> partners, uh, work side by side on a, a variety of different issues and on behalf of a variety of different subpopulations of youth. Um, so I manage two projects on behalf of LGBTQ plus youth as well as commercially sexually exploited children. Um, the LGBTQ plus youth project, which we'll talk about today, uh, started in 2013 as a region, original research. So we went around and talked to young adults who had recently exited these systems, identify as LGBTQ. Um, we found that their experiences are consistent with experiences of youth in these systems across the nation, LGBTQ youth and systems across the nation, um, which you know, in, in some are overrepresented in these systems and experience mistreatment and have worse outcomes. I mean, if I'm to sum it up very quickly, because this is the second part. Um, and so we developed, um, in partnership with hundreds of stakeholders across the state, uh, what's called the Protocol for Safe and Affirming Care. And there, if you haven't received the handout, there is a executive summary we're providing. We ran out of printed copies, but it's available online and, and better as an online document. And then there's also this document called Overview and Timeline. So once we completed the protocol, we then launched into a pilot implementation in Spokane Juvenile Court, Spokane Children's Administration, which is now the new department, as well as King County Juvenile Court, um, and have now just completed that pilot implementation. So that involved all these aspects on here. Um, and so the first part of the session really was about the lessons we've learned from this process. Um, and just to recap, lesson one is know your why. What's the purpose behind serving this specific population of youth? Know your terms and concepts. Um, so uh, vocabulary is important. Um, three is, is sweat the small stuff? Because what we may consider, you know, quote unquote small or simple things actually have a huge impact on youth. And we talked about microaggressions and that sort of thing. And then four is we're guilty until proven innocent. Meaning that we have a proactive uh, responsibility to the youth we serve to show them, to demonstrate that we're safe and affirming. Um, and so we're actually gonna get into lessons five, six, seven, and eight, I believe in this presentation, and it's gonna focus more on the implementation of this SOGI questionnaire, which is on the back side of the overview and timeline. Um, but before we do that, uh, we'll just go over the objectives pretty quickly. So these were the objectives in the first part. The second part is understand the benefits and challenges of discussing SOGI, so that's again, sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression with youth. Um, reflect on um, the process, you know, our administration of this questionnaire, and then uh, identify and address concerns that you have. Um, and to, to start you off and, and simulate some of these um, reasons why we do this, uh, Day is going to take you into an activity. Right? Thank you. Yeah. So we've passed out um, for folks this, uh, this sheet. I know we just gave you three pieces of paper. Yes. This is the one that you wrote on, and I asked you to complete out. It's called, it's the activity is called the impact of silence. Um, I'm supposed to use the clicker. Yes. Okay, did I go too far then? No. Okay. Yeah. Technology is my friend. Um, so what we want to do is we want, um, if you haven't already, please name um, the three most important people or relationships in your life, three places that have a special meaning to you, and three, topic, three topics of conversation that you and your family usually discuss, um, and then 
three of your favorite leisure activities. Does anybody need a little bit more time to complete that part of the activity? No, great, yes. Oh, Kim's going for it. You're good. <laughs> so the second part of this is it's gonna be partner work, so some of you may need to move around a little bit. And what we're gonna do is we want you to find somebody that you don't know well. So if you partnered in part one, we're gonna encourage you to partner with somebody else. And um, one of you is going to start with the speaking part, and one of you is going to start with the listening part. And essentially, can you tell me your name? Carol. Carol, may I use you for an example real Absolutely. quick? Absolutely. So my goal, if I have the um, speaking part, is I, or the listening part, I'm sorry, is I want to essentially want to get to know Carol as best I can, right? So I'm, what am I going to say? I'm going to ask Carol questions like, hi, how are you? How is your day? We've never met before. What kind of things do you do for work? So you don't have to answer anything yet. Mm -hmm. You know, what is... Right, I'm gonna try to get to know Carol as best I can, but Carol is not allowed to share any of the responses that they've listed on their sheet of paper, right? So none of these, again, most important people or relationships, um, special meanings, topics of conversation, or leisure activities, right? So I'm gonna spend about, we're gonna do this for about a minute and a half, and then we're gonna switch, and then Carol is gonna have the opportunity to ask me the same questions, okay? So we're just going to simulate that conversation. Are there questions about that? Uh, so when I'm talking, I can't reference any of these. Nope, things. none of those things. So that's that's our magic rule. So okay. you're not allowed to share any of those things. We really want to. This is do not mess up, right? There's no punishment involved. I just want to be clear about that. Um, but but don't talk about something on your card. And if you do, um, if you do share something, you risk what that person despising you, rejecting you making judgments about you if you share something on your card, okay? I know you're looking at your partner like, be nice to me, <laughs> right? So we're gonna go and find a partner again. If you partnered with somebody this morning, please partner with somebody else. Um, and we'll just take a few minutes and I'll holler out when it's time to switch. Ready, go.
was in mental health counseling. I'm about to become an associate in the fall. And I started working on And there's a lot of laughter in the room, which is always a good indicator. But but sometimes that also indicates nervousness or uncertainty. But how was that experience for folks trying to get to know the other person? Bizarre. It was really weird. How so? Because you, the conversation doesn't flow because you're not actually getting anything. So you're have to keep skipping around topics and looking for some sort of response, and there's nothing coming back that's mm -hmm. Right, there's nothing coming back that's useful. So you're sort of just sort of skipping around looking for something to talk about. Anything to grab onto, place to connect, right? Do you think that could get frustrating sometimes at some point? Oh, yeah. Getting some nods. Laura, do you want to say more? Yeah, I feel like it's really easy to get frustrated with the other person when you feel like you are clearly being evasive. <laughs> like, that doesn't make sense. Right. Uh, but, and then you can just say, why aren't you cooperating? Right? Why don't, or why don't you like me? Or can't you tell I'm trying to build a relationship with you? Like, why are you not just like, I'm a likable person, right? I think, I mean, usually. Um, what about for the other side, or other, th or either side, really? What else was it, what was it like to, to hold on to some of the information that's important to you? You have to really think of who all is bothering you. Like, if I ask you a question and mm -hmm. you know you can't say the answer, you have to, like, think of another way to say it. Right. Yeah. It takes a lot of effort and control, mm -hmm. right, to hold some of that back. Other thoughts? I was glad it's, uh, it, it, for me, it was a very familiar dance. And if anything, I was mildly surprised by just how easy it is. Because I, I know that I've played this dance at previous jobs mm -hmm. with family. Like, it's a very familiar dance and probably easier than it should be. So you've gotten really skilled at the dance, right, yeah. because you've had a lot of practice yeah. around doing it. Um, did it almost feel second nature to you to, to step into the dance? Were you wanting to potentially tell Will more? Um, I'm putting you on the spot here. Oh, yeah, no, it's fine. Um, like, all the things that I avoided are things that, like, with my close friends, I would completely go into it. But right. it's sort of like just slipping into a second personality almost. That's, Ooh. like, such a, that's such a familiar persona at this point mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, I can't talk about, like, uh, like two of my common conversations with friends are politics. I literally wrote down gayness. <laughs> I was like, how else can I summarize this? But those are both two highly taboo topics because I used to work for the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and then my whole family are, as you might guess, conservative Christians. So I'm like, ah, oh, yes, we're just adopting personality too. <laughs> the, the straight, uh, what is it, middle road, not really liberal, like you say, hey, right. you talk about family, you talk about cooking, you talk about all the friendly and easy. Right, the weather is always a source of conversation. It's a very conversation. easy transition, but in nature of the exercise, I'm slightly surprised that like, it shouldn't be that easy. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Other folks shared a similar experience you want to expand on? Yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, on the flip side, when it was my turn, it was a little bit less than cut, but I just felt comfortable um, because yeah. I'm usually there getting everyone else to talk. Right. But it's a little bit more challenging for me to talk about myself. Oh, interesting. <laughs> Right, and so feeling that barrier, right? Feeling that barrier come up. I think too, it's some. Uh, somebody, was talking, somebody was talking about dogs. You just overheard. Sorry, mom. What? 
did you get where you wanted to go in that conversation? I don't know if dogs were supposed to be talked about or not <laughs> talked about. <laughs> now I feel like you feel like you're going to be in trouble if you <laughs> like watch back. Little mischievous look on your face. No, I was I was trying not to talk about the things on my car, so I was able to talk about dogs. Okay. So, I mean, I guess I felt more like what you were discussing. Right. Kind of a neutral, a neutral topic. What does this simulate? What do you think this is simulating? Right? In daily life, right? So we talk about the dance. We talk about things that are safe for us to talk about, right? So imagine being either in your current role or in a similar role as an advocate or a case manager or a teacher or a medical practitioner trying to get to know a young person, right? Because you want to, the intent, of course, is you want to support them. You want to advocate with them. You want to help them get their needs met. And you know they're holding back on really crucial information that you probably can help with and yet we're waiting for that, for that relationship to build where they feel that they can give themselves pr permission to share that, right? Um, and, uh, and I don't know if I should say oftentimes, but I think it's not uncommon for adults to feel frustrated or irritated or even mad at a young person where you're just like, I'm trying to help you and you won't let me, right? Because it becomes about us a little bit more. We want to fix it or we want to do something more and we forget to shift the need back to the young person that it's their timeline in which to share some of that information with them. And that's true for anybody. I default to young people because we're talking about child welfare and juvenile justice systems. But that really does, um, I mean, obviously there's no age minimum or maximum around that. And I think it's, it's a great reminder for us to check that and understand what that impact can be, not only for ourselves in terms of wanting to help somebody, but for that young person deciding, can I share this? Because I shared it before and it slapped me across the face. Or I shared it before and I got kicked out of my house. Or I shared it before and I got sent to church. Or I shared it before and, right, so how do we build on that? How do we create that? And so um, I really, you know, having um, facilitated this discussion and, and done it, too, on the other side, like I never get tired of it because I'm always like, oh, that was a pretty crafty response day. You just worked right around that. And the skilled adults in the room, which is normally everybody in the room now, is like, yeah, I just saw it right through that one, right? So we'll keep coming back to that. Clicker, not the <laughs> all the reminders, right? So out of the listening to their voices report that CCYJ um, generated out of uh, the focus group statewide, <coughs> is some of these um, some of these shared experiences, right? That there are a lot of assumptions made about young people. I love this. I call it a postcard. Um, don't assume I'm straight and don't assume I'm gay. Right? We don't know, and and now of course, as we know, with more and more language and the gender diversity that we're seeing, is that really we can't make any assumptions about anybody's SOGI status. Um, I was actually sharing with Nicholas earlier this morning, I was like, sometimes it's hard to be a cisgendered mixed um, by woman in this environment because I feel like I'm going to come in and like feel like I'm connected and yet I also can feel the discrimination because I look the way that I do so I don't look gay enough and I don't look straight enough. Um, so it can be difficult to navigate those just first impressions or what people are going to make assumptions about me. Um, and so again, putting myself in the, in, a, in, a, in the mindset of a 15 year old, how is the person I'm working with gonna, how am I gonna feel open to that? Like, how am I gonna respond to that? And then David Leviathan is not a young person, he's actually a playwright, but I also love this quote as well because it would be too, I too easy to say that I feel invisible, which sometimes is easier, but instead I feel painfully visible and entirely ignored. So it's really saying, I see you and I don't care, <laughs> right? Or I see you standing there in front of me, and it makes no difference. And I've worked with um, with other staff who are like, but I, you know, it's fine. I'm cool with it. Like I don't care what somebody's soji status is. Those aren't their words. I'm paraphrasing because they don't know soji status, right? And I'm like, but that's privilege, right? You don't have to care, but it might that it might make a huge difference to that young person. They care about their identity. They care about their expression and being seen. So b kind of neutralizing it could sometimes backfire. Like, yes, you have the intent of being an open and accepting person, but what is the impact on how you're delivering that? This is, um, these are quotes that are also coming out from the listening to their voices um, report from trans, uh, specifically transgender uh, youth is that I feel more neglected in the foster care system than at home with my real parents. I'm not surprised. I'm, I work inside the child welfare system and I'm not surprised by this. This tells me how much work we have to do not only for our young people, but for our staff and for our caregivers. Many of our caregivers are, um, 
are licensed through um, child placing agencies so that it's an extension. So what are we doing to provide training and resources for caregivers? There's a lot of work that has to be done internally, but there's also that extended work in terms of how we're building some of that relationship. And we've had stories, um, the, the terrible ones and the supportive ones, right? Um, how do we recruit caregivers? How do we provide those environments? Um, what is that? Um, how do we explore that? And then the second one, I think a lot of us, when we're young, tend to get thrown away. And so we try to survive. And sometimes that involves shady things like stealing food and what have you. And for me, I immediately go to trafficking, right? So that you're thrown away, you're on the street, you've got, what, less than 12 hours before someone approaches you to trade, um, trade for sex. And so again, we're seeing that disproportionality there as well. And what other ha also happens then is that young people, um, if they're not able to, they, they, they don't receive the appropriate services, right? So maybe somebody comes into care or somebody comes into uh, the classroom or the system or what have you, and they're hungry, right? But instead, you see somebody who's angry and frustrated and throwing their books on the floor and having all these external behaviors, instead of slowing down and saying, girl, what do you need right now, right? Girl might say, I just need to eat, right? Instead of we'll be like, that's an appropriate behavior. I'm sending you to X, Y, and Z, right? So we lose that relationship and we, and we lose that ability to help meet the needs that Carol might have. Thank you for letting me. You're right here. So I, <laughs> I usually pick on Nicholas, but he's over here today. So. Um, and so then what we do is we, cre we create unsafe spaces, right, for people to be queer. Um, that we label them that the gen gender identity is a symptom of a psychological illness, that we need to pray to God and accept Jesus. You know, we've had, um, it's not uncommon for, for us to s continue to see um, conversion therapy, which, you know, has come in front of legislation again, um, or that people will say, yes, I'm, you know, a queer-friendly home and have a young person come into their home and then they immediately take them to church and they start you know, they can use that against them, if you will. So how do we open up that dialogue um, so that we're not mis, um, misproviding services that are needed? I don't remember how far I go. No, I'm, I'm next. You're next, okay, awesome. All right. So the, the title of this session is the, the why and how, basically, to talk to youth about SOGI and these systems. And so really that, I think, well, that was meant to help establish the why, right? Um, that there is an impact to silence, um, and it's damaging to youth. And when we don't talk to youth about SOGI, they end up with either inappropriate services or really unsafe services. Um, and so we decided, you know, this is important. And, and talking to youth, this is, doesn't come without controversy, and adults, right, and professionals. Should we ask youth about this? And, and many were on the side that, like, no. <laughs> because who knows how that information is gonna be used? Or, or some said, you know, it's none of our business. Um, but when we started to unpack these issues, um, the more we talked to youth, they're like, well, you know, because we talked to youth, for example, I had an exchange, and you said, no, it's none of their business, it's th these adults. They don't need to know who I am. And I, will, I said, well, what if you needed something like a support group, right? How would they know to get you to that support group unless they knew this information? And the youth was like, okay, you got a point. But they should do it in a nice way. They should do it in a respectful way. They should do it you know, and questions that are positive, not put it next to, have you ever, least, have you ever sexually offended, and then are you gay, right? Because you're, you're stigmatizing the question when you, you couple it that way, right? So um, we did reach a general consensus after a lot of work that yes, this is important, that lesson five, I, we sort of glossed over that slide, it is our business to be asking this question. Um, but there's also another reason why we're doing this. And to sort of put this in context, if you look at this sheet, the overview and timeline. So again, we did some research. Um, we developed this protocol or a set of guidelines. Um, but there's sort of tiers, right, of, of making change. And so you can do a report. And maybe some folks will read it. And maybe a very few will change based on that. But I think most will leave it on the shelf, you know, you know or the inbox or something like the to read box that never gets read or something like that. And maybe guidelines are a little bit better because they're a little more concrete. And maybe, which we did, you'll see here, training on those guidelines is even better because then they get some training. But what we found is you can't stop there, with, at least within these systems, and I'm, I'm guessing within the systems that you work, you probably can't stop at just training. It's that ongoing um, provision of sort of technical assistance or support that really makes the difference. And so that's why in this, um, project, we formed core teams, so we have sort of LGBTQ leads within each of these agencies, and we meet with them every other month on a phone call and talk about how things are going, 
um, identify ongoing training needs and bring that in. But even that, based on our evaluation report, isn't what made the change. What made the change was when we developed a questionnaire that actually forced probation counselors and caseworkers to sit down with youth and talk to them about SOGI. That's what they said actually changed their practice, when they actually had to confront, okay, we need to talk to youth about sexual orientation and gender identity. This is the crux of what it means to actually be, build a safer and more affirming um, environment for our youth within these systems. And so I wanted to go through this questionnaire and just talk a little bit about it um, and how we arrived at these questions and why they're important. And it has did, do not distribute and a watermark. And that's simply because we'd prefer, I guess, you not to go out and use it without training. So we'd actually prefer that you contact us and invite us to your agencies and, and to actually provide this training and talk about it because we're happy to do that at no cost to you. We just think it's important that it comes with training and that we shouldn't be doing this sort of just like start handing this to youth, right, without any sort of background or context or, or you know, ensuring we have the resources to support the youth. Um, so some of these questions are pretty simple. Number one, you know, age, just kind of simple. Number two really gets at race and ethnicity. And one of the reasons we really wanted to include this is because, um, I don't want to get too data wonkish, but this, the information collected here is actually put in a separate system. It's not in the kids or the youth's general file. Um, and that's a way to protect privacy because this is a pilot, this is so new, we don't want to actually to be in their court file. Um, so therefore we can't compare any information here with their court file information. But we did want to look at the racial and ethnic breakdowns because what the national data shows is that it's vastly disproportionate. When we're talking about LGBT plus youth, transgender, gender diverse youth in these systems, we're talking about transgender youth of color. We're talking about gender diverse youth of color for the most part. Within juvenile detention facilities, of those that identify as LGBTQ plus, up to 85% are youth of color. I mean, that is just shocking to me. Shocking? Yeah. Because we're looking at about 50, 60% of youth of color in the, the overall general population, right, within that, which is already vastly disproportionate. When you look at, you know, King County, I think has, I think it's 7 to 9% African American population, yet 50% of the youth in juvenile detention are African American. But then when you break it down by LGBTQ plus youth, if we're consistent with national literature, it's 85%. So the disproportionality grows when you add in that layer of sexual orientation and gender identity. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, I just want to make sure I'm, yeah. Um, so that's why we included this question. We think it's really important to not only pay attention to sexual orientation and gender identity, but also how race and ethnicity overlays that and impacts. The next question really gets to sexual orientation. And you'll notice we're not using these words because we didn't feel the need to when we're talking to youth. It's just, you know, I consider myself to be. And that's an easier question. And that, after a lot of feedback, is what we came up with. Um, number four, it's actually four and six go together. So um, the, the best practice, if you will, or the national data showing, and, and looking at gender identity, the recommendations are to do a two-step question. One is, how do you identify as your gender identity, right? Because uh, maybe, you know, I'm not going to say cisgender male necessarily, I might just say male. And a transgender male may just say male too, right? Um, and that's fine for how they identify, but if you're trying to collect data, um, then I, you need that added question. So it's actually a two-step question is asking gender identity as well as the sex marker on, or sex assigned at birth, so what's on your birth certificate. And that's how that's recommended, and so that's how we're doing. So we're asking, what's your gender identity, um, and then what's on your birth certificate? Um, five, this gets uh, really difficult, but I think it's really important. It gets to gender expression. Um, and this is really important. How many of you have seen Annette? Anybody? Oh, God. Yeah, I know. I couldn't oh. sleep on Sunday night. I watched it, and I just, um, and I really like that, subtitle. yeah, it's on. She's It's, I'd recommend it for many reasons, but one of the reasons is it really talks about the impact of gender expression. And we can't, it's not just someone's sexual orientation or gender identity that, that may cause them to have mistreatment in the systems. It's really gender expression. Um, that puts folks in danger. So you could be a cisgender straight person, but if you are perceived to have a gender expression that's not conforming to societal standards, you're in the same sort of danger as 
uh, youth with you know minority sexual orientation or gender identity status. Um, the problem is, is how do you assess that? Um, and so I talked in a little bit in the last session about the Prison Rape Elimination Act, um, and that actually requires folks in jails and prisons and detention facilities to assess that, but ask the professional to do it. So it says, ask you to mark on a piece of paper, is this youth conform to gender standards? But see, to me that's very problematic. Um, and so we wanted to try to do it in a different way, and so we're actually asking the youth to, a to assess how others see them. And it's not going so well, to be honest, because I don't think folks are understanding the question. So we're still working on this. Um, we think it's important, but we're not sure how to ask it or assess it. Um, six I mentioned was the birth certificate question. Um, and then we also added a sub-question of, do you identify or ha have you been identified as intersex? No one has marked this question. Um, often folks don't know it's not on a birth certificate, um, but yet we don't want to leave this off because we think that's important to recognize. Um, seven, have you had a stable place to live? So this gets with the overlay with homelessness. So also very important. Um, what we found in our research is, you know, there's a commonly accepted statistic that 40% of youth experiencing homelessness identify as LGBTQ+. Well, other research shows that of those LGBTQ youth experiencing homelessness, 60% have come out of the child welfare system, so foster care, right? So I know this is like math, but 60% of 40% is 24%, so about a quarter. So you could say that one quarter of all youth experiencing homelessness are both LGBTQ plus and have child welfare experience. A quarter of the youth homeless population, right? And that's not even the juvenile justice. So we, it's a huge impact, and we see this project not only as a, a way to improve systems, but also prevent youth homelessness, and that's our hope here. Um, eight. Ask them about how their, their comforts are trying to get youth voice in here. How comfortable are you within these systems? And then nine, really thought it was important to include an open-ended question and give youth the ability to say, you know, these are the services or resources I'd like to be connected to. And this has been really surprising. Because again, this questionnaire goes to all youth age 12 and over. We're not doing just, you know, oh, the youth we think look gay or transgender. No, it, to challenge assumptions, right, to not make assumptions, we need to ask all youth. And so that's part of the, the protocol. Um, and so all sorts of youth have answered in different ways. Some have said, well, you know, I really want spiritual guidance, right? I want to be connected with the church. And like probation counselors are like, well, I never thought of this. But it's like, well, maybe these youth have never had the opportunity to just answer an open-ended question about what they want or what they feel like they need to be successful. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, so that's the questionnaire. Are there any right. questions on this? It's administered in what county? It's administered in Spokane County Juvenile Court. Just Spokane County. King County Juvenile Court. Oh, King County. Yeah, and the Spokane Office of the Department of Children, Youth, and Families, and their adolescent and legally free and ICWA units, meaning that when youth, um, well, youth adolescent unit is so youth 12 and over, and then the legally free means when their parental rights, the parental rights have been terminated and they can be adopted. So, and then ICWA is Indian Child Welfare Office. So. So any questions on this questionnaire? And another thing is, is that this is a work in progress. So if you, if you feel like there's something problematic or you think, oh, maybe there's a better way to do that, we're open to suggestions and, and would happy, happily take those. I think the other thing just to piggyback oh, yeah. too is that we're pilot, we've piloted it in these yeah. areas and we're looking to expand yeah. it statewide. So the goal is to, to move it out. Right. To move it out. Okay. Yes. Thank okay. you. I'm going to echo Glenn. And yeah. There's a field. Yeah. Like make, are you going to expand some of the JR facilities? Is that why? So I just always ask myself. Like I, so we I will, I, I literally have not turned down any requests for a training or to come out and do that. We, if, <laughs> if people will have us, we'll come in and do the training right. and provide so the technical you assistance. Are responsible for the fact that it's in that system? Or maybe no, no, I don't. Okay. I think that's a PREA requirement, honestly. Oh, maybe that's yeah. why. Yeah. yeah. Maybe. And that, that's a, another point to make that in the juvenile sort of detention and facility type, that it's usually been in the medical context where this has been collected. This is actually the programmatic context, so they're actually, yeah. you know, with their case manager, the probation counselor, yeah, caseworker, right? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, did you? I'm sorry. Did you have a question? Well, yeah. oh, it's just you know, a you should have an a and a b because you're asking about the juvenile justice system and the child welfare system. 
Right, well, there's actually different questions. It's slightly worded differently for the child welfare and for juvenile justice. This is like the master form, but yeah, it's actually um, the same questions, but worded so that it's unique. And then at the bottom, yeah, it's changed, so. Um, this is just a few quotes um, from the professionals um, in these pilot sites. So in Spokane Children's Administration, a quote, it did open up those conversations. Maybe I wasn't asking in the same way otherwise. There's one person on my caseload, very complex person. I had no idea they identified as LGBTQ. Had I not asked those specific questions, he gave me so much more information. Uh, King County Juvenile Court. For the intake workers, having this SOGI conversation is so unique and new that it's a positive advancement that has never been happening before. And indeed, only 25 probation departments in the entire country ask about SOGI. So we're now 26 and 27, right, based on our research. Um, so on that the title slide, oh, there is another handout, yes, thank you. Um, on the title slide, it said, it is our business, but our is asterisk, right? Because, of course, I don't think everybody should be asking this question, you know, or administering this questionnaire. And we spend a lot of time talking about, you know, who should do this? Who should be collecting this information? And there quite honestly is a tension because we want to get this information as soon as possible, uh, especially in the child welfare context, because if we're looking for a foster home for youth, right, we want to find an appropriate foster home. So there's that tension. We want it as soon as possible, but there's also this tension of, we also want to build trust with the youth, and that takes time. And so we're trying to balance those things. And so within these systems, uh, this questionnaire is administered towards the beginning once a youth is matched with someone that they're going to have an ongoing relationship with. So in the juvenile justice system, this is a probation counselor, someone who checks in with them monthly. And in the child welfare system, it's a caseworker who is responsible for monthly checks, right? Yeah. Um, and so they're going to do this initially, and then they're going to revisit this around six months, and then they have the discretion to, to fill it out at any time, and a youth can request to fill it out again at any time and change answers. This isn't a hard and fast. It's very important that we know that things evolve, and as you develop relationships, you're more likely to disclose information. Um, so this was just our initial guidance about you know, when to use this, when it's likely appropriate, and when it's not. Um, and it depends on who you are, when you do it, and where you do it. So I don't know why I'm looking up here. I have it right here. But um, so who you are, right? Um, it's somebody that's going to have a confidential or quasi-confidential relationship with someone. So not a judge, because that's an open court, right? Um, but an attorney actually would probably be one of the best because it's a privileged relationship. They can't share any information without their uh, client's permission. Healthcare providers pr uh, protected by HIPAA. Um, but also caseworkers, uh, we talked about this a little bit in the last session, have a lot of discretion. They don't have to share all information with the court. They get to protect some of that information. Uh, same with probation counselors. Um, so, you know, youth who are arrested, we don't recommend like law enforcement, right, ask right then. Um, in fact, that's would be very counterproductive, or even judges, because that's an, um, that's an open court, or intake staff, right, who they're just going to have that interaction with once, and it's not going to have an ongoing relationship. Um, time, again, this is that balance. So youth have told us we want time to adjust to this system. It's traumatic entering these systems, right, and being asked all these personal questions. And this is just one of many assessments. Um, so still trying to find that balance there. Um, and making sure that it's not in conjunction with questions that are about deviant, you know, quote unquote, deviant behavior. Um, um, so setting private, non-threatening settings, um, uh, not in areas that are open to the public. Uh, you know, I was doing this training a few years ago with probation counselors, and um, a very well-meaning probation counselor was like, said, you know, I know that this young person was struggling with her gender identity. I know that was the issue. Um, I tried to talk to her for two hours, and she just would not disclose to me, and so I can't help her. I'm so frustrated. And another person in the room raised their hand and said, well, who else was in that meeting? Oh, or her parents, right? <laughs> well, understanding that, yeah, it's often parents are the source of conflict over um, SOGI issues, and that's important to provide a private setting. Okay. Um, so, lesson, so lesson five is it is our business, and I sort of outline the reasons why we think it's important to talk to youth about SOGI. One, so that it gives them an opportunity to express themselves. 
helps match them with appropriate services, um, and it really changes the way that our systems work. Um, lesson six is sort of about the um, secondary benefit to that, and that is that we get to collect data. Um, and maybe this sounds boring or dry, but you know, there is an old adage, you don't count unless you're counted. And I really do think that's true. Um, because for so long, system leaders denied that even LGBTQ youth existed in their systems. Right? And how are we doing on time? Because I was going to. Okay. okay, so I'll go through some of this data if, if you're interested. So we do have some very preliminary data from the pilot. So I just want you to review it with caution, right? We can't draw conclusions, but I think it's interesting to, to just look at some of the numbers um, and then compare it to what the national data says. Um, so there were uh, about 230 questionnaires completed um, throughout the pilot, um, showing about 89% uh, of youth identifying as straight, 1% um, as gay or lesbian, and 6% as bisexual, 1% questioning, 1% prefer not to answer. And so does this mean that this is an accurate representation of who's in the system? Not at all, right? That's why I'm, I just, this is very cautious here. It's like, we're just starting this. And so, um, you know, when they've done this in other places, a way to test it is to do, okay, we do a questionnaire like this with youth, but then we also come in months later and we do an anonymous survey. And an anonymous survey, unsurprisingly, is way more youth identifying as LGBTQ youth because it's anonymous and then with another person. So it takes time for professionals to develop the skills and relationships with youth so that youth feel comfortable disclosing. Um, but this is actually, uh, you know, it's fairly consistent with estimates of the general population uh, in terms of straight and not straight, not necessarily this breakdown. Um, but I think it also highlights what at least anecdotally we're hearing from youth is that you know, fewer and fewer youth are identifying as gay or lesbian, it's more hearing queer, bisexual, uh, poly, non-binary, those sorts of, um, an expanding vocabulary to describe right. our identities. Right, right. Um, this is gender identity. So again, we asked the two-step question, sex assigned at birth. So 73% were assigned male at birth, and then we're showing 75% identifying as boy or man. So that's showing that you know, there's the self-identity of transgender, and then there's also the, um, the sort of social science definition of transgender, which is uh, a gender identity that does not, does not align with the sex assigned at birth. Um, and so that's what we're looking at there. Uh, this is the regional breakdown. Um, so 13% in King and then 12% in Spokane. Uh, so this is a, a comparison, um, and I apologize, you know, we've worked hard to not conflate sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression, but in many studies that we compare this to, they are complete, they're just put into one. Uh, so in the Washington population, although I think this may estimate may be low, it's 7%, they say, the general population estimates, 7% identifying as LGBTQ+. Although I've read other articles that say millennials, like 50% are some, identify somewhere on the spectrum, so I don't know how accurate that is. And then in juvenile justice system, um, some of the best data we have says about a quarter, or a fifth rather, 20% identifying as LGBTQ. Um, so about three times that of the general population. And then child welfare, the best data we have is actually out of Los Angeles because there's a research institute called the Williams Institute and they do pretty good research and there's also a tremendous number of uh, foster kids in um, Los Angeles. And they do break that out by um, transgender and then LGBTQ, um, and so the total was about 19%, so about the same as juvenile justice. But in other studies, it's, it's been even higher. So, um, you know, a fifth to a quarter of the population of these systems on national studies when it's anonymous surveys are identifying as LGBTQ+. Any questions at this point? Am I going too fast? Or, I know, beta slides are sometimes. Um, trying to look at, uh, Race, right? So of the LGBTQ youth, um, of those who identify as LGBTQ, 30% are um, youth of color. Of those who identify as hetero cisgender, it's 50-50. Um, so this is actually contrary to what, um, right, 
the national data is suggesting. So, I mean, you could theorize this. Maybe youth of color feel less comfortable disclosing their sexual orientation and gender identity. I mean, that could be one theory, right? We don't know. We don't have enough data. So that's why I'm saying uh, be careful to not draw conclusions. This 50-50 is, like I said earlier, this is consistent with the, the census in, within King County Juvenile Court, at least, that I know. It's 50 percent. Um, well, 50 percent African American. It's even higher for youth of color. Um, so here's a comparison uh, to the national data. Sorry, it took me a minute. Um, so racial disparities among LGBTQ juvenile justice involved youth. So like I said before, 85, in this particular study, 85% of LGBTQ youth in this detention facility were the youth of color. Thank you. Um, homelessness. So we are showing trends already, even with the preliminary data um, of disproportionality. So um, of the LGBTQ plus youth in, in this, that have answered these questionnaires, 61% experience with homelessness as compared to their straight cisgender peers of 43 percent. I mean that's to me almost two-thirds of the LGBT youth entering the system have experienced homelessness and almost half of you know all have experienced homelessness. So really um, there's a movement now really looking at systems um, overlap with homelessness and a uh, it's in statute, I believe, that by, is it 2019 or 2020, no youth exiting the public system in Washington state will be exiting to homelessness is a goal, 2020. Um, this is the most surprising to me. So LGBTQ youth are saying that they're more comfortable than the straight cisgender youth in the systems on these questionnaires. Again, we, we don't know why. Maybe it's the fact that they finally had an opportunity to talk about their identity on a questionnaire, and maybe that adds the comfort. I don't know. Um, so, okay, any questions on lesson six on the data? Okay. So we really wanted to provide you with an opportunity to strategize on your own. So looking at these lessons and thinking about what you can do. Um, so in a moment, um, you know, I'd like you to, it's called a 15% solutions. And 15% solutions, this theory is, is that, um, you know, when we want to make change, that there are a lot of things, and we tend to focus on them actually, that require additional resources or authority, but that about 15% of everything we can do right now without additional resources or authority. So I'd like you individually for a few moments to just think about, you know, what are three things I could do right now whether it's from this presentation or from other presentations uh, at this conference or other things that you've learned to make your respective agencies or courts or, or systems safer and more affirming for transgender and gender diverse youth. So go ahead and take a few moments. identify those three, I'd like you to circle the top one, so sort of prioritize. And this says, I apologize, I, I needed to change the slide and I didn't, because we generally do this as a more uh, general presentation on behalf of LGBTQ plus youth, but you know, given this conference, we really want to focus on transgender and gender diverse youth. So we should change this to, you know, circle the item that you think will have the biggest impact on transgender and gender diverse youth.
And then next, I'd like you to please get into groups of three or four and just take turns sharing that circled item. Um, and then other group members should ask, you know, clarifying questions, provide ideas and suggestions, and then we're gonna come back and, and talk about these ideas. Any questions before we begin about the activity? Okay, so go ahead and get into groups.
If anyone would like to share. So the agency that I've been working in for the past five years, an issue that I see is, well, we don't need to worry about trans stuff because they're young and they haven't figured that stuff out yet. And so I find myself having to correct a lot of microaggressions. But so my idea was basically practicing call-in culture mm -hmm. and communication even if my problem a few years ago was I was too nice mm -hmm. so sometimes I, I need to be firm and I need to say hey that's messed up mm -hmm. yeah. let's talk about that but I think the thing that I also want to work on is modeling that non-defensive stance when I'm called in so like for instance I'm oppressed in my
my trans identity, but I'm privileged in my white identity. Mm -hmm. So if I'm ever called in or out or maybe a racist microaggression or something that I've done, I want to be able to sit back and listen to that feedback and apply it. Because I don't think my colleagues whom I'm irritated with can take me seriously if I'm just doing the same crap that they're doing, but right. in a different way. That's what I want to bring. Right. I love that because you're t it's taking ownership in multiple ways and modeling at the same time, which is really hard because being able to recognize where we have privilege may surprise us sometimes. Um, and then how do we um, counteract our own <coughs> patterns of behavior, if you will, that we're already comfortable in, right? So maybe making a comment or agreeing or, they're just, or blowing something off or ignoring something, right, it can be really critical in terms of when other people are watching us all the time in terms of how we engage. So. Um, I think there's a balance in there with rest. Sometimes, you know, we can't stay militant, if that's the right word, on like trying to hit every single microaggression, right? You don't always want to be the asshole in the room or the conscious asshole in the room. Can I say that? Um, but it's tiring sometimes to always be the educator. I know for me, like sometimes I just, just don't want to deal with it, right? So there's that fatigue in there as well, but modeling that makes it everybody's lift, right? That's awesome. Thanks for Other ideas? You know, oh, go for it. So one of the things that I've noticed in my institution is, um, you know, there, when a kid identifies and comes out as trans, which is their pronoun and which is their name, mm -hmm. sometimes it takes a while for the staff to revert to using their appropriate name. Mm -hmm. A really long time. So that's something we could definitely work on as a system. Is like, I mean, who chooses a name? You have to go by it. We need to all go by it. Even when we're talking about the kids, not to be the kids. Yeah. Which is a great place to practice that, right? Mm -hmm. It's a great place to practice that. Um, one of the thing, yeah, and I was one of the things I was telling Nicholas that one of the reason I like this activity is I know for me I come to conferences or workshops and then I walk away feeling dismayed, like I am not doing enough, right? I can't do this. Like, and we talk about authority and resources and barriers, I, you know, working for the state, there's a lot of those. Um, and there's a lot of things that I can do right now and, and practice is one of them. You know, we become lazy in our vigilance around trying to make that change, right? So it's giving it lip service without um, giving it the energy that it needs around that, for sure. And I, you know, again, working with child welfare and, and trying, when training folks, like say and a young person might change their name again and they might change their name again and they might change their name again. And so right now, in trying to protect confidentiality, we're putting that in case notes rather than in uh, other places where it might automatically complete a form, and then that form goes out and gets generated, right? So it's one, one small aspect. But then it's staff have to be vigilant about checking that case note to say what name is that young person going by now? Um, is it the same? Is it different? Um, and asking is okay, too, right? So I think it's easy to get lazy when we feel like we don't have to be. Other thoughts? 15% solutions? Yeah. Uh, so I was at the Trios who was with Houston Foster Care nice. and I recently worked on our free store of the warehouse. So um, my thought is upon getting back, get it like making a sign or a poster that actually like states that we're LGBT affirming, trans yep. affirming. Yep. Um, that was actually, I met someone who utilizes our services like two workshops ago and discovered that apparently we don't give off that Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. they were like, I feel like I can't get like my foster son a pink sweater. And I'm like, oh, we should fix that. We should fix so that, So yeah. making like an actual sign that we can post up. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. And I don't know if you heard too that the, if you like the poster that uh, CCYJ has, um, that the young artist created for CCYJ or mm -hmm. for the project, I should yeah. say, that's accessible to you too yeah. if you, if you want to start there or create one of your own. And it's also a great way to get your young people engaged, right, is do your own contest for artwork. Mm -hmm. And that's true for everybody. Yeah. It's not just true for you. Yeah, all these, the slides or materials, they're all available and we'll put up our email addresses at the end so you can just email us, I think is the best way. I, apparently there's not a website where we can upload these, so we'll just send them directly. Do you want to? I mean, in terms of websites, there's also a really great website and I think they're gonna be here tomorrow, um, Trans Student Educational Resources. Mm -hmm.
mm. services, mm -hmm. and they have like upload downloadable yeah. um, posters. Yeah, they do the gender unicorn. So if you were here this in the morning, that they created the gender unicorn and, and other really great resources as well. Definitely. Trans trans student uh, education, education resources. resources. I was like, yeah. thank you. Any other thoughts? Yes. One of the students that came into the school mm -hmm. and the, they continue to have uh, conversations with the head of school and the students divided by gender. Mm -hmm. like, having brought it up repeatedly, mm -hmm. but a lot of the fourth grade girls are going to have lunch with the head of school, fourth grade boys are going to have mm -hmm. And I would love to see that stop and to have that. And we talked about it, it just mm -hmm. has not been implemented. By a variety of different categories over the course of mm -hmm. the year, just to get more of a cross section of queer dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. One that I would like that I think is helpful in situations where I feel like for some of us, I've heard being like, I know I can do this, I can't necessarily make anyone else do this. It's not something that we've been doing a lot recently. Um, No, and I found that with child welfare too, where we were yeah. bringing their um, bringing the work to the surface. There definitely was um, some of those assumptions on why are we calling these, you know, why are we calling these people out? Why do we have to have special policy? Why, why, why? And um, aside from answering those questions and not punching anybody in the face, it was more like if I could frame it in a medical, like here's why we do this, right? Because it reduces self harm, because it reduces self coping mechanisms, because then we're able to provide a safe there or we could you know, re reduce depression and suicidal ideation. That's their framework that seemed to work for those who live in that very square box um, because it took it out of a personal person's yeah. personal stuff and made it something that looked like a, um, right a health outcome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. How do we, how, yeah, right. it's, not, it's not an exciting <laughs> one. So I, yeah, it's a great, and I hadn't thought yeah. about it before um, in that way that it would be useful in that way. Yeah, it really goes back to lesson one, to know your why. Yeah. Um, and also we found consistent, that's consistent with the, <coughs> excuse me, the findings from the evaluation report of this pilot. A lot of probation counselors talked about how, you know, I think there was before this attitude, well, if parents are going to do it, then like, what does it matter, you know, like, but now they're like saying, no, even if a parent's not affirming, I get to be the affirming person for that mm -hmm. child, and I see the impact that that makes, and that's pretty, been pretty special for me to see that. Other thoughts or comments? We built in time for your questions, so kind of a quiet group. Yes? I just want to say I appreciate the invitation because when I actually combined with the team of the team that I work with, I work at a clinic and I share that study with our team. And, you know, and our team tends to be pretty affirming, but there's like, you know, there's folks that are kind of further along in mm -hmm. and sure. there's folks that are like, we're like, come on. Um,
Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna bring that back to Maine for um, the child welfare system, Wonderful. the foster care system, and helping do to do training for the transition specialists mm -hmm. that help youth transitioning out of oh, wonderful. foster care. But one thing that the youth in foster care say that that they every time they go into a new home, they have no idea if they can be themselves. Mm -hmm. So um, incorporating that activity to um, in those trainings would be really, I think, revealing. Thank you. I think in theory they can understand like, oh yeah, this is important. But until they experience like, yeah, that is really difficult not mm -hmm. to talk about the things that mean so much to you. But I wonder, like, they don't have any way of knowing if the homes that the kids are going into are opening and accepting. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you know of any system where they actually ask that of yeah. the foster parents. Yeah. I know for a fact New York State, at least on paper, actually makes it a requirement. So now to become a foster parent, you have to openly say, I will be safe and affirming for an LGBTQ child. Yeah. And in Washington, they at the licensors, they, in the, in the uh, home interviews, they do ask, um, what are your, it's kind of an open-ended, but like, how do you feel about work, or how do you feel about um, hosting or having an LGBTQ plus identified youth? And then it's kind of up to the licensor to navigate that conversation. Um, that, you know, and it's tricky because um, you know there are few. Uh, I hope there are few people who will say I'm friendly and then not be friendly. Right. Um, but part of, you know just recently navigating um, a case a case with a uh, a licensor who was like, they say they're friendly. Clearly, they are not friendly. There's other indicators in the home and other comments made throughout the interview, mm -hmm. and so their role as licensor is to basically talk them out of um, uh, licensing with us at least and maybe going through and then giving resources for maybe this would be a better fit and going through an agency that's more openly discriminatory. I don't know how else to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how else to say that. Wow. I just, you know. Um, but then there, we're also seeing that more, uh, more um, child policing agencies are being more proactive about um, providing training and, uh, and recruiting for LGBTQ friendly uh, folks. So like mm -hmm. just last week, Nicholas and I were uh, sitting through a pilot training um, with, a, with a local um, a local agency, and that's starting to happen more and more that I'm familiar with in Washington. Um, and then um, Lambda Legal actually does a really great, has a really great piece on uh, child welfare state by state in terms of LGBTQ policies. Um, and if, and it also tells you who has uh, religious exemption and don't have to address those needs, so that's also really nice to see. So that might be some places to look at. But yeah. Yeah. And another thing, I don't think Day can mention it because she works for the state, but I think I can mention it, is that, <laughs> that Congress um, in their, the, the budget provision for child welfare, so the federal dollars that go to child welfare, they have now that's called an Adderholt Amendment, so this guy named Adderholt, I don't know where he's from, um, and of a particular party you could probably guess. Uh, that's a joke. Uh, um, right. Um, has basically said we're going to withdraw federal money if you have LGBTQ protections in your foster care licensing because it discriminates against religious people. And so Washington would actually lose up to, I think it was like $15 million if this did go through. So that's just something to be aware of. So there is stuff, uh, I, you know, it's sort of policy wonkish, but we do get federal money and there's that sort of things going on, so I think those are important to pay attention to. And then what's serendipitous about that is under, in this, under the Obama administration, um, child welfare was being tasked with collecting SOGI, yeah. LGBTQ information, but now it's going live under our current administration. And so there's a lot of tension, understandably, um, within the system of like, what's that gonna look, what are we required to do, do we wanna do it, is it safe to do it, now what's the information gonna be? Not that those questions weren't asked before, but it's a very different environment to be in. I can say that much. So, so are we, are we okay. So this is our um, this is lesson eight. Is we're here to help, <laughs> literally provide any sort of training or consultation. We're happy to provide materials. Um, this is our contact information. And then I really like this quote. So if you allow me to just let's read it really quickly. Um, this is not from me, it's from the Annie Casey Foundation report, and it just says, every youth has a gender identity, not just transgender youth. All youth express their gender, whether they transgress or conform to gender norms. Every youth has a sexual orientation, not just gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth. Creating a professional environment that acknowledges and respects youth across the full spectrum of gender and sexuality permits all youth to explore their emerging identities, prevents mistreatment based on anti-LGBT bias, and promotes the health and well-being of all youth. 
It also sends the message to all youth that self-determination and affirmation are core values and gives all youth the opportunity to define themselves in a supportive and affirming environment. Learning respect for differences will serve youth in all parts of their lives. And that's, to me, the fundamental reason why I do this work. So thank you very much. Thank you.